Let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, we're going to be reading the first nine verses as we begin our study in the book of 2 Thessalonians today. We're going to talk about Paul's ministry in the city of Thessalonica. Let's all stand together as we give honor to the word of the Lord. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in as it was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great number of, great many of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some of the wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a couple of uh, announcements this morning, uh, things to be aware of. Um, at Discovery Church, we have something that's called covenant membership. Um, covenant membership is something that we all agree to. Um, we preach some messages. It's in our constitution what our church covenant is and uh, principles that we are uh, engaged in following from the Word of God. And covenant membership is a yearly commitment that we make to the body of Christ here at Discovery Church. And uh, we'll be doing a Another uh, recovening of membership the last Sunday in January. But throughout the year, we've had some come in and covenant to membership with us. And we'd like to introduce a, uh, two couples this morning. I didn't tell them this was going to happen, but uh, our new covenant members are Frank and Linda Bale. Where, they're right here. Sit, so, And Colin and Amanda Reisner. Colin's over there. So we're just grateful for God bringing new uh, members uh, to Discovery Church. Also, Wednesday night, uh, we're going to do a redo of soup, right? It was the best chicken noodle and chili, okay? And we have a sign up there. Uh, we almost ran out, okay, because it was so good, and Pastor had three bowls. That's probably why. <laughs> almost ran into a 1 Corinthians chapter 11 situation there. Um, but anyway... Um, there's a sign up. We'd love you to come so that the ladies know how much to make. But it was, it was really, and I heard it's going to be really cold on Wednesday. So soup ought to be really fantastic. So that's what's going on. And so uh, let's get going with the message. Second Thessalonians. We're going to start a series today from the book of uh, Second Thessalonians. I think you'll find this study pretty compelling in light of our times. Because... There are prophetic sort of instructions that come in this book in the second chapter. And so um, I think we've been do going through on Wednesday night um, the agents of the apocalypse. And uh, Paul identifies one of those agents, the Antichrist, in chapter 2. And uh, we get some sense of things that are happening in our world that are shaping up toward this uh, Day of the Lord, when, when God brings His judgment to this earth to deal with sin once and for all and to, to deal with the children of Israel. 
the nation of Israel in this final week of prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled that we're looking forward to. Now, at the outset of any study on the Scriptures, it's really important to have background information, right? To know why this letter was written, to understand the context, to understand the people. Why did Paul write this letter at this time in his ministry? And how did this all transpire? Because it gives you a sense of how you could sort of put yourself in the text and understand why these things were written and how they apply to us today. Now, it was in Acts chapter 16 that Paul began his second, began his second uh, missionary journey. So uh, do we have that map? I got some visuals for you today. This is the second missionary journey. And you can see that Paul began Jerusalem up through Antioch. He's making his way across the cities that he wants. I got this cool little laser if it works. See that? Okay. All right. And he's making his way to the city of Troas. All right. He's done a lot of missionary work in the, in the region of called Asia. It's Turkey today. And that's where many churches were established. They went, Paul witnessed the mighty movement of God's spirit establishing churches in the Asia Minor region. And once Paul gained sort of a, a following and a stability in a church, he went on to another one. And so he continued to move on to other churches to encourage people and to share the gospel for the first time. And from Luke's account in the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit directed every, every step of Paul's ministry and his movement in ministry. And up to this point, Paul's testimony for the gospel, telling people about Jesus Christ, was limited to the continent of Asia, as you see up there. But somehow, as Paul was ministering, he had a dream. He had a vision. God spoke to him in a dream. And in this dream, Paul was in the city of Troas, which is on the border of the Aegean Sea, on the edge of the continent of Asia, the western edge. And in this dream, Paul could sense there was a man dressed like a Macedonian, talking like a Macedonian, pleading for him to come over and help. Well, Macedonia is right in here in this area of Greece. And so Paul discerned from this dream that God was calling him to share the good news of Jesus Christ and plant churches for the first time in the continent of Europe. Europe had not received the gospel up until this time. So Paul set sail to the town of Philippi, which is right up here. That was the first church that was planted in Europe. But we know that as you read about the ministry in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, ministry successes didn't come without some personal cost that Paul had to endure. Paul and his traveling companions were subjected in every place they went to intense persecution. And following their release from jail, they were urged by the officials to go to another place, to another place. But we see in Philippi there were some traumatic things that took place, some exciting things for the gospel. We noticed that there was a lady by the name of Lydia, a very wealthy woman, a woman who sold uh, very exclusively designer purple garments that were dyed in Thyatira, and she delivered them to other places in the world and was very much successful in business. But when she heard the good news of Jesus Christ, how that God had come to this world in human flesh to save people from their sins, to save them from the, the dreadful thought of dying and being ever eternally uh, with no existence or um, being completely without any hope in death, finding out that in Jesus Christ there was hope, there was forgiveness, there was life, there was reconciliation with God through the death of Jesus Christ, Lydia responded to the good news. Not only did Lydia respond to the good news in Philippi, but also... Uh, you notice as Paul was arrested and Silas and thrown into prison um, during the night, there was an earthquake and all the, the jail doors, the cells, the, the, the doors on the cells opened. And 
the jailer, who was a re, more than likely a re, retired Roman soldier working out his time in life, no longer in the battle, this soldier came upon all of these doors, prison doors open, and was worried that all the prisoners had escaped. And he was ready to do himself in with the sword when Paul and Silas confronted him and said, hey, we're all here. It's okay. And this man convicted about his life and seeing the power of the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ lived through Paul and his, his uh, Silas who were there singing praises to God in prison even though they had been persecuted and, and roughly treated. This jailer said, Sirs, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the man did. He surrendered his life to Jesus. And he, he told his family of what God had done through Paul and Silas. And he told his family about the good news of Jesus Christ. And they believed. And so this church was planted in Philippi. But then persecution arose and Paul had to quickly leave Philippi. And he made his way to the next city, which was Thessalonica. Okay? Thessalonica. If you go to Greece today, there is a city called Thessalonica. Quite interesting. And what you can see in all of these missionary journeys, Paul was not easily discouraged by opposition. I think that's kind of convicting. Because sometimes we can be discouraged by opposition. Right? When you run up against opposition to the values that you have and the Christian faith that you're living out and the convictions that you have that are based on Scripture and you find out that people may mock you, people may make fun of you, people may even just walk uh, 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 completely around you because you might be one of those people that they call a Jesus freak or some kind of radical or some kind of a devout person that they just don't want to have time with. It's really easy to go hide your Christian life when you face opposition. But it's amazing the Apostle Paul knew that God had called him in salvation to be a witness, a testifier, someone who would go out and boldly speak to other people about Jesus Christ and every person's need for a salvation in Jesus. And I'm so thankful that throughout the century of centuries the church has been in existence, there have been many witnesses to the gospel who didn't stop in the face of discouraging times to keep proclaiming the fact that Jesus is the Savior of all. That they weren't easily sort of discouraged to sort of go hide under a rock after facing opposition for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so they went to Thessalonica, the great city of Macedonia. It was the largest city in Macedonia because it was known for its location, being on the Aegean Sea, as being a very integral uh, port in commerce. And many things happened uh, that were, where it was strategically placed. There was naval operations there, certain things going on. Now, we also know that Thessalonica had a rather large Jewish population. You say, how, how did they get a Jewish population? I mean, weren't, weren't all the Jewish people in, in Israel? And if you know the history of Israel and the Roman occupations and all of the, the, the unrest and trouble in that land, even during the, the silent years between Malachi and the writing of the New Testament and the coming of the angel to uh, Elizabeth saying that John the Baptist was, was, was coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. Even in those times, there was a lot of turmoil, wars, unrest, and many Jews decided in that unrest to go other places, to find a more peaceful life somewhere else. And many Jews found a peaceful life in Thessalonica. Why was it peaceful? Well, Thessalonica was a Roman colony, which certainly which meant the Romans didn't 
have a large military presence there. They allowed local leaders to govern their people and their city, and as long as they could keep the peace, right, it would help the Romans not have to, you know, police the area. Because if you saw how big the Roman Empire was at this time, if you put that slide back up there, I mean, you're talking this is just a small slice of the empire. And to have the personnel and the manpower to police the whole area was almost impossible. They didn't have enough people. And so what they did was try to get local leaders to agree to keep the peace and we'll stay out of your business. But if there is turmoil, uprest, we'll have to come and set it down. We'll have to take care of it. So obviously, you can see, as we read in Acts chapter 17, when the Christian gospel was preached and the Jews decided to raise a ruckus about it, the local leaders were concerned about it, right? We need to keep the peace. We need to keep the Romans out of here. We need to figure out what we can do to stop, you know, this, this unrest. And so we'll see whatever we can do. And that's how, um, basically, it's, and it's so interesting that the Jews would claim that the Christians were not claiming allegiance to Caesar, right? Um, I don't think the Jews claimed allegiance to Caesar, right? They weren't too excited in claiming allegiance to the Roman God or the Roman king who thought he was a deity. But it's quite amazing that they pointed out that the new Christians were proclaiming their allegiance to a new king, Jesus Christ, right? Um, And if you would have asked the Jews, well, who do you claim your allegiance to? I don't think they would have uh, honestly said that they were claiming uh, um, allegiance to Caesar. But they used it for their own benefit to create a ruckus. But we notice that the gospel did take effect in the city of Thessalonica. There were people saved to eternal life. A church was planted. Paul began to uh, take new converts to Christianity, right? New followers of Jesus Christ. And he began to teach them, instruct them, disciple them, help them learn some important truths that they would need. And we know that Paul had probably a certain um, set of things that he wanted every Christian to know. A set of principles, discipleship-wise, of things that they would need to know so that their faith would be grounded, that their confidence in Jesus Christ would be secure, and that they would be prepared for whatever threats would come against them in their spiritual life. And so Paul began his process of teaching and discipling and grounding these new Christians at Thessalonica in the Bible, in the word that they had, and to help them gain their footing, their strength, their confidence in their Christian life. And in that process, the Jews got a little bit miffed, right? They got a little bit um, discouraged, and or in, in, they, they created this problem for um, Paul and Silas and the, the, the New Testament church, the church that had began there in Thessalonica and created a problem. So Paul was ripped away from Thessalonica. He was, he, his, his teaching ministry there was preempted prematurely by persecution of the church. So he had to leave and go on to Berea, to another place. He didn't have as much time as he would have liked to train these believers in their faith. But it's amazing as you look at the letter how much these people have grasped, how much much understanding they really have. And it's kind of interesting the things that Paul told them in a very short period of time after they became Christians. And you know, one of the things I think that we often struggle with in our culture and society is um, once we embrace faith in Jesus Christ, we come to new life. Because we are very busy people, because we have a lot of commitments in life, we don't always take the time. We're not always uh, 
understanding that in order to grow in our faith, it requires time spent getting information and instruction from the Word of God so that we can live this Christian life with confidence, with with assurance, with understanding, with um, a knowledge of where to go to find the resources that we need if we're facing discouragement. Where do we go when we face crisis? Where do we go when we face disappointments? Because as much as we try to instruct people through the regular teaching we do on Sunday morning in a worship service, it takes a lot more uh, time uh, to really ground people in the confidence that they have in Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times our struggles in the Christian life come because we haven't taken the time to disciple, to grow, to understand how great this salvation is in Jesus Christ. And I have to say I've really enjoyed teaching Sunday school. I know a lot of you don't come to Sunday school, and I'm not here to throw you into a guilt trip to come to Sunday school. But I have to say it's been a joy teaching the importance and how comprehensive and how great the salvation we have in Jesus Christ is. As we have uh, begun a study um, to become like the Lord Jesus Christ, how do we do that? First comes the understanding of what is this salvation and why this is the greatest decision that you could ever make in your life is the decision to follow Jesus. And then understanding how that decision came about, how what, what benefits and blessings come to your life, Next week, we're going to talk about sanctification. Today, we start, talked about adoption. As a Christian, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, who've embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says you've been adopted into God's family. God has claimed you for citizenship in His family because He loves you. He loves you. He sent Christ to die for us even while we were still sinners. God demonstrated his love because he wants to claim from humanity children who can belong to his family and that he can shower his love, his grace, his blessings on them in this life and not just in this life, but he wants to shower his blessings on you for all eternity. We have an amazing God. But sometimes when we get busy in life and we get so hooked up into the mundane responsibilities of life, we can easily lose sight of how much God loves us, how much our life is valuable, whether anyone else says anything about it or not, that God values us and he claims ownership to us as our Heavenly Father through our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's no greater identity than you can ever have in life than telling someone when they ask, who are you? My name is, is not necessarily John Cook. The most important thing about me is I'm a child of God. That's what I claim to fame in my life. And that understanding did not come through my own effort, through my own means. It became because God focused his love on me in Jesus Christ. He changed my heart. He brought a regeneration of my heart. He brought the desire in my heart to to step out in faith and trust Jesus to save me and to repent of my sins. And he gave me a new life as Jesus took up residence in my life through the power of his spirit. And you know, People ask me, somebody asked me this the other day, Pastor, do you, do you do a lot of counseling? And I said, no, I don't do a lot of counseling. I don't do a one-on-one. I do it every Sunday morning when I stand up here because the greatest counsel I could ever give you is that if your identity, if you cherish your identity as a child of God and you embrace that and you live in that, a lot of your problems are going to go away in life. Because so many of the problems we face in life become, come because we're insecure. We're insecure. We don't know who we are. We're seeking to find out. 
We try, to, we try to gain our security at our job, and we find out that can be kind of fragile based on whether our employees like it. We try to find our security maybe in sports or maybe in this or maybe in this arena of life. We're trying to find security. Will someone just acknowledge me that, that I'm okay, that, I, that I'm worthy of their time, that I'm worthy of, of having an existence on this planet? And you can find out that there is a tremendous movement in our society to figure out why people are committed committing suicide at an alarming rate. Why is that? Have you ever wondered that? Why are people to a point of despair in their life that they don't want to live anymore? It's because their, their identity, their understanding of why they exist, why they're here is so shattered by disappointment, by frustration, by by rejections of people and relationships in life, and they're just looking for a way out, and they don't really know that there is a Heavenly Father who loves them beyond all comparison and loved them enough to send a Savior. And not only has come to give them life today, but has come to give them an eternal future with Him forever. It's a God who wants to claim them in an adoption. That if they had a crumbly earthly family, if they had poor parents, that if their, their dad was a mean-spirited kind of, kind of angry person that, that didn't show them any love, this Abba Father, your Heavenly Father, wants to show His love to you that He's the best dad you could ever have. That's what this Bible teaches us. We have the best dad. who who puts his arms of love around us every day, and he welcomes us, and he longs for our fellowship, and he longs for us, longs to show us his love for us. He is pleased to call us his children. See what love the Father has for us that we are the children of God, and that's really what we are. John says in 1 John chapter 3. And when you can get your security, when you ground your security in Jesus Christ and His love, you, you stop playing the world's game of trying to gain acceptance through this, that, or the other thing because you don't need that acceptance. You already have the greatest acceptance you could ever have in life, and that comes from God through Jesus Christ. You'll never be accepted more than that in life. You'll never be more accepted than the acceptance and the love that you'll never be more loved by anyone else than the Heavenly Father as He pours out His love for you in Jesus Christ, seeking you to become a part of His family through faith in Jesus Christ. And so many of us could be much more content, more satisfied, much more at peace, much more joy in our life if we could live in the confidence that I am loved by God, I am accepted by God, I've been adopted into His family, not because I was worthy, but because Jesus Christ died for my sins and He is transforming my life to become like the Lord Jesus Christ in all I do. It's the greatest identity. It's the greatest strength that we have in our Christian life is that God loves us in Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Do you know that? Uh, Obviously, you can see that was not in the script of the message this morning. And, and, And it wasn't. Because I know there are many people who walk in a lot of discouragement because they just don't feel like they measure up in life. They've tried a relationship and, and found out they were rejected. Couldn't quite measure up. Looking for someone's approval, someone's acceptance. Many bad choices we've made in life trying to just seek to, will you love me? Will you accept me? And finding sometimes it's, it's very fickle, it's very conditional, it's very, very much not all that constant. And I want to know is that some of the greatest mental, spiritual health comes to our life when we embrace that God loves us in Jesus Christ 
And no one can love us like God loves us. And when we receive that love through Jesus Christ and learn that we are adopted, we are claimed for God's family, and we are treated like family as he lavishes his love upon us, as he lavishes all these abundant promises on us in Jesus Christ, we can be secure. No insecurities. We can be secure. Somebody doesn't accept us, God accepts me. Someone rejects me, God has never rejected me. Someone didn't like the way I did this, God loves me. Because you all know we live in a critical world, don't we? We all know that people put others down to try to elevate themselves. And they do that because why? Why does anyone want to elevate themselves? Because they're insecure. They don't know who they are. So you stop striving, you stop fighting when your identity is supremely secure in Jesus Christ. I don't have anything to fight for. I've got it all. I have Jesus. I have everything. And that's the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. God takes very dark, sinful, discouraged, defeated, weary people, and he says, I want to give you a new life. I want to come to you and rescue you. I want to show you unconditional love and acceptance that you've never, ever seen before in life. I want to give that to you so that you can be secure. So that you know today is secure, tomorrow and the future is secure because of Jesus Christ. And when you have that identity, when you have that security, you don't have to play the games. You don't have to play to the crowd. You can stand up with great boldness, as the Apostle Paul said, to people who are skeptics and scoffers and people who are ready to persecute at any uh, length his, his life. And so he could confidently say, I know who I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until the day of my death or Jesus comes. I'm confident. I'm confident that neither life nor death nor principalities nor powers nor anything can separate me from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest security that you could ever understand and come to have in your life. That nothing can separate you from not, not the rejections of men, not, not the hardships of life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And he will always love you. He will always accept you. Based on what he's told us in his word. And when Christians are secure, when they're not striving so hard for acceptance in this world, they become powerful witnesses, powerful examples, powerful um, proof that the gospel works, that the gospel's real. You know, when you're content and you're secure, when you're at peace, when everyone else has got a kind of try to uh, get in the rat cage of life, and you're just, oh, that's, that's okay. You can do that. My security is not based on this, that, or my security is in Jesus. I'm a child of God. My future is all established. I don't have to have a huge 401k. I don't have to be thinking, I mean, it's not that I'm not going to say for it, but that's not where my security is. My security is much more stronger. It's in Jesus Christ. And I'm completely loved and accepted by him, and that's all that really matters to me. Well, there's three purposes in three chapters. You notice in Thessalonians, there's three chapters, right? Second Thessalonians. Each chapter, Paul has a purpose to fulfill in writing these chapters of the letters. And as you look at the three purposes of the three chapters, they really define, in a lot of ways, why God gave us his word. Three purposes God seeks to fulfill in giving us his word. The first purpose is God gives us his word to encourage us. That's what you're going to see in the first chapter. Paul is encouraging Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. He's encouraging. He's pointing out good things that he sees happening in their life, even though they're suffering for their faith. And he, he, he outlines that for them. 
And you all know how that is. You can receive criticism a lot better or someone's evaluation of where you fall short, right? If they start by telling you where you're doing good, right? How many can say that? You go to the boss's office. I have some good news and some bad news, right? You'd rather know that there's good news, right? You'd rather know that, hey, here's what I really appreciate about your labor, about what you're doing, about how you serve this company, whatever else. But there's a few things that I have to tell you about that I would like you to improve on. Paul is that person that starts every letter with words of encouragement to his, to his people, to the Christians, to followers of Jesus. He wants them to be encouraged. Even in the face of persecution, that word is coming back to him through a lot of witnesses that what? You guys are doing well. You're growing. You're making progress in your faith. Don't worry about this persecution. Do you know, one of the most interesting phrases in Acts chapter 17, it comes in, I think, verse 6, where the people come and say to the officials in Thessalonica, these guys are turning the world upside down. Yes! I thought about that. You're going to discuss that if you go to life groups tonight. What would it take for people in the world to say, Discovery Church is setting the world upside down? That was their characterization. They're upsetting the world with their message of new life in Jesus Christ. People are being freed from the bondage of enslaving habits. They're being freed from the, 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 the enslavement to guilt and shame for their bad choices and mistakes. And they're finding freedom and forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. That is upsetting the world. And Paul comes to encourage these Christians Keep going. Keep upsetting the world. Keep living for Jesus. I want to encourage you. And the Bible is a book full of encouragement. God is here to give us promises, encouragement, hope, confidence. Sure, there's going to be warnings. There's going to be exhortations. There's going to be things that Scripture are going to point out in our lives where we, where we need to improve, where we need to trust Christ more, where our faith needs to grow, where we may not be uh, as obedient as we need to be in certain areas of our life. The Scriptures will do that. That's the third point. Scriptures are given to exhort us, right, on how to live a godly life, how to represent Jesus Christ well in this world, how to be a good testimony, how to live together in harmony as people who are very diverse and different and have different ideas, different ways of doing things. And sometimes there has to be exhortation to keep us thinking about what we need to do so that we can live in harmony and peace with one another. So you, have, so you have encouragement and exhortation. Encouragement is, is very positive. It's uplifting. Exhort, exhortation is challenging. It challenges me. It challenges my conscience. It challenges sometimes my conduct. It, it challenges, you know, my thoughts. It challenges, you know, where could I improve? What things might I need to do? And... It shares with me the power to do that comes not in myself, but in Jesus Christ and yielding to him. So we have encouragement. We have exhortation. And right in the midget, middle of that, a third purpose of Scripture is to educate us. The Bible teaches. It helps us to understand God. God wrote this book to us so that we could fully understand or we could understand what he wants us to know about him. This book educates us on what is spiritually true. Now, it's kind of interesting. Um, on Friday night, I was watching 2020, and uh, Leah Remini was on sharing about her, um, her 
expulsion. She was, she was kicked out of the Scientology movement. And I, and I have to say, this is only a religion that could be created for ho- people that live in Hollywood. Okay? Some of the bizarre things that this religion espouses to is beyond me. Some xenon something from somewhere, you know, started it all, and some metaphysical, and you, you give your life to them for a billion years because you're going to be keep on reincarnating. And, I, you know, only in Hollywood, right? And this, this young girl was given to this by her parents when she was very young. Been in it for 30 years. But found out it was quite legalistic, quite quite harsh, quite quite something that she she parted ways with them and boy they let her have it. And I wanted to write her an email, but I don't know how to get a hold of her. Say, Leah, try Jesus. Leah, try Jesus. He's the answer. You see, the Bible was written as to educate us, to help us understand God's truth, but it was also given to educate us about all the things that are false in this world. You see, the Bible's like a truth detector. If you want to know what's true, you're going to find it in the Word. So it always, if you see something like Scientology, you compare it with the Word and you say, "Uh uh-uh, that is completely false. You just know that 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 is far out false teaching. And Paul had to do that because the minute he left Thessalonica, what happened? False teachers came into the church. What did the false teachers say? Hey, guys, you know why you're being persecuted? It's because the rapture already took place and you missed it. You missed the rapture. Jesus already came for the church and you guys missed it. Sorry. That's why you're being persecuted. So these Christians are going, wait a second. That's not what Paul told us, but but that's what these guys are telling us, and we're we're not really sure, and so they're all upset. And so Paul goes to great length to remind them what he already taught them and to add to it, hey, you'll know when the day of the Lord comes. Because if you're a believer, you won't be here. You're going to be with Jesus. Because he's going to talk about our gathering together with him. Oops, that he already talked about that he already talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we'll refer to that. What is that gathering? When does that come? So the Bible is very good at educating. It helps us to understand the truth of what God has for us. And and it takes time to understand it. It takes time to, to put yourself in a position where you can receive instruction from God's teaching. So the Bible is there. In every case, to encourage us, to educate us, and to exhort us. Will we receive that? Every time I read the Bible, it's going to inform me of things I didn't know. To ground me further in my confidence in Jesus Christ. And when I gain confidence in Jesus Christ, I'm encouraged. And it's going to exhort me, it's going to challenge me. To live above this world, knowing I have the power in Jesus Christ to be victorious. It's going to do that. And I guess I I wish I could jump on top of this, this roof and tell you with great emphasis why I think every one of you needs to have more dedicated time to reading this book. Because God wants to show you how good He is and how great His love is for you. But it takes time. It takes time. It takes discipline. It takes time to, to stop our busy life and say, God, you, I need refreshment from you. I need encouragement from you. I need help from you. I, I, need, I need you to educate me in the truth so that I won't fall into the, the worldly system that's just there to chew me up and spit me out. I need to know that I'm loved and I'm accepted. I need to know that I have a security in Jesus Christ. 
And every Sunday at 8.30 in the morning, I get here to pray for you that God would put a hunger in your heart for His Word so that you will grow to understand how secure, how loved, how confident you can be in life because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you and wants to do in and through your life. And I pray that every one of you here today knows Jesus personally. Because one of the things the Bible really educates us about is how we can know Jesus personally. How we can have a relationship with the God of this universe through our faith in Jesus Christ. We're here this morning to remember the Lord's death in the communion service. We take a cup that reminds us of Christ's blood that was given and offered to cleanse us from our sins. We take a piece of bread that reminds us that Jesus went to a a cruel cross and was, was sacrificed on that Christ, willingly giving up his life so that the power of sin over our lives could be broken and that we could live in the power of Jesus Christ, no longer fearing our sins and the guilt that it brings, but having the confidence that our future is in heaven eternally with Jesus. And all Jesus said is in remembering and taking these elements, we just give thanks. We give thanks that we have a Savior who loves us, a Savior that is working in and through our lives, a Savior who accepts us and who gives us an identity as children of God. Folks, this is our opportunity as kids of the Father to give thanks for how we got there. It's through Jesus. How did we get our citizenship? It's through Jesus. It was placing our faith in Jesus. I ask you this morning, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you, have you embraced the identity Jesus wants to give you in your life of being that you know with 100% surety you're a child of God? You say, how do I do that? Well, God, if God has spoken to your heart today, right where you sit, if he's, if he's spoken to your heart, you know you're a sinner, you know, you know you've you messed up, you've failed, and you reach out and you acknowledge that sin and you by faith say, Jesus, I trust you to forgive me of my sins, and I trust that you died on the cross to forgive me of my sins, to pay the penalty for those sins. The Bible says if you, if you confess with your heart and your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you'll be saved. Jesus will come into your life. You just commit to following Jesus today. I want to follow Jesus. I'd like everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. If you're here and you, you want to follow Jesus today, could I just ask you to raise your hand? Nobody else is looking up. If you want to follow Jesus, I don't know. where You, you could have been at this church all your life. You could have been here a long time, and you've never really committed to following Jesus, but you want to follow Jesus today. I just want to know that. You want to be sure. I want to follow Jesus. Father, as we prepare this morning to remember your death, we're thankful, Lord, for the encouragement we receive in Scripture from you, that you love us. The encouragement that even while we were still sinners, Christ, you died for us. Father, your word educates us. It's important to remember your death until you come by giving thanks by examining ourselves to making sure there's, there's nothing in our life that keeps us separated from you and fellowship from you, and we just want to do that this morning, examine ourselves. Lord, your word exhorts us to forsake the things of this world and to, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Lord, as we look at the book of 2 Thessalonians, we're going to be encouraged and we're going, to be, we're going to be educated and we're going to be exhorted. And I pray that through this process, Discovery Church will upset the world in Yankton. That's my prayer. We'll see an upsetting of the world for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus in this community. We'll see people claiming new life claiming citizenship in heaven through faith in Jesus. We'll see the transformation of lives through the good news of Jesus. Maybe, maybe through the Christmas season, we'll see something very powerful of your spirit working in this community and the communities that surround us. 
that you'll draw people to a newfound faith in Jesus Christ and find life in him and will upset the world through the gospel. And we give you thanks, Lord, for what you'll do in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.